Imagine a world with 1500 square kilometers of pure wilderness. No defined walking tracks, no vehicle access, the big desert wilderness park has been largely untouched from human existence. Now today, you can't drive through the park, but surrounding it is some of the most underrated four-wheel driving and camping in Australia, and we are gonna explore it all. All right, welcome back to Aussie Arvos. You're probably looking at me and Patrick standing here in the middle of what looks like to be nowhere in front of a, a grain silo. Hang on, not just a grain silo, a woman holding a yabby. A woman holding a yabby and a boy <laughs> on a bike, and we're essentially just in the middle of a field. Well. Pretty much where we are is we're right outside of a small town called Rainbow, which is just in the northwest corner of Victoria. And we've come here because it's right on the edge of a very underrated uh, four wheel drive destination for Victoria. 100%, we are coming into the Big Desert Wilderness Area. Now, you've all heard of Cape York, you've all heard of, heard of Fraser Island, but Big Desert is some place that not a lot of people know of, but it's some of home, some of the biggest dunes, the best sand driving you can find south of, you know, Australia. Um, we're heading there right now, so we're gonna go find a campsite. Yeah, and, um, yeah. let's just get straight into I'm it. I'm so excited, I can't wait to explore like a <laughs> desert. It's sick, it's like, it's- A desert that, I'll give you a hint, it doesn't actually look like much of a desert, but it is. Mallee country. Yeah, there All you right. go, that's the one. Let's get onto it. <laughs> All right, so we've just pulled up briefly because we, well, we're gonna cross uh, Lake Albacatya, which is right over there. There's actually, because it's a dry lake, it doesn't, mm. well, from what I know, it doesn't get water in it. Yeah. Um, you can actually drive right the way across. So we've just pulled up here, we're probably gonna drop the pressures and chuck it in four, just in case we run into anything. But, um, so yeah, it's, um, this is pretty much the gateway. This place is absolutely incredible. I've never driven on a lake before. Like, it's just so weird seeing something so flat. Yeah, it's like, it's pretty crazy. Like, even though there's a lot of flat land in Australia, they don't really have a lot that's like this, just no trees naturally. And it's like, it's all nothing in the middle. And then there's a ring of like bush around it. It makes you really feel like you're in like an actual basin of a lake sort of thing. Believe it or not, this lake used to be full of water. It's got a boat ramp and all, and back in the 70s, people used to ski, fish, and boat around the lake. The lake generally fills and empties on a 20 year cycle, and due to its excessive nutrients like nitrogen, Lake Albacatya is able to support an abundance of aquatic plants. It's also home to a lot of wildlife. After crossing Lake Albacatya, we made our way towards the Norman Rock Track and into Big Desert. We instantly began to see the environment change around us as we followed the sandy track into the park. As it was getting dark, we decided to pull in for the night and set up camp. It had been a big six hour drive that day to get up to Big Desert, so we we're pretty keen just to chill out by the fire and make some dinner. Waking up in the desert is just something else. An almost endless sunrise with blue skies as far as the eye could see. It was a stark change to the weather we'd been having in Melbourne. All right, so it is the morning. It is freezing cold. Um, and we're just getting ready to uh, head off and hit some tracks. As you'll see behind me, we've jerry-rigged the uh, redneck sand flag. Um, these are not actually like a necessity in big desert. Um, you don't actually have to have one. And I don't think like, where well, I didn't use it last time I was here, but um, there's a lot of dunes where you literally, like you can't see over the other side. And so they're not a bad idea. And we bought the stuff for it. So it's just a bit of PVC pipe, cable tied to the bull bar with a high-vis vest zip tied to the top. 
So yeah, we'll see how it holds out, but I think it's probably a good idea. So as you all know, I've been running the GME 6.6 .6 DBI antenna for a while now, but on this trip, <coughs> we're putting on the big boy. Now, I've had this thing for the better part of a year, um, but I've just never had a practical kind to actually use it. Like, you know, where we live, we don't live in the desert, so there's really no point for it. But this is an 8.1 DBI high gain antenna uh, from GME. I've never actually seen many people use this, like at all. Like, I guess, because, you know, unless you are in a desert, you don't really need that high gain. But this is the one you want on if you want super long range communication. So for those who don't know, high gain essentially just means a more narrow transmission pattern. So for this thing, you're, you're gonna get a longer range, but less sort of vertical and down. So not, not as good for mountainous country, but for desert stuff, this is what you want. So um, as you said, Lee's got a high vis jacket over there. So later on, if we think up, like, like we need it, we might go cut it up and put a bit on mine. And then yeah, we'll both have sand flags and um, also good comms. So yeah, excited to see how it goes. He does that sometimes. So we left camp and made our way towards the first big sand dune of the day. All right, so here we are at Lookout Dune. Um, this is literally like 15 minute drive from uh, where we camped last night. The first sort of big dune to come across along the Milmud Rock Track. And so we're standing at the, well, pretty much the top of it right now. And you can see our, well, you probably can't see our cars all the way down there. And uh, we've got a gun it up here. It's actually looking pretty firm, like not too soft, because it's early in the day and winter time obviously helps. So yeah, I reckon we'll give it a pretty good stab. I don't think it should be too too uh, hard for us. Here we go. Oh, wombat holes. Alright, so made to the top of Lookout Dune. Actually, it's a really nice lookout, isn't it? <laughs> it's bloody awesome. So, that obviously wasn't too hard. We both did it pretty easy, but it's good to be on our first track anyway. So, we'll just go jump back onto Milmud Rock Track and keep following it sort of north. And anything we see on the side that we want to look interesting or we want to drive up, which there's a few, um, yeah, we'll just do it. See what's there. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Just keep going. Awesome. Not a bad day for it, though. So a really good way to describe the driving in Big Desert is basically a lot of bumps. The Milmud Rock Track is 62 kilometers of pure sand driving with plenty of dunes to cross. It's also home to many offshoot tracks that lead to even bigger dunes. All right, so we just uh, cut off Milmud Rock Track. There's a dune just literally right off the side. Um, yeah, it doesn't have a name or anything. There's like two lines. One's like literally a dirt, well, a sand road that's really compacted. That one's really easy. You can tell someone's already been up it today, but this is the hard one. I, we couldn't do this last time, but we did that one. So I want to see if we can do this because it's a bit harder, but it's still soft up top. It doesn't look like anyone's driven it. Low range, try to get to third. So we go. Oh, 
<laughs> Did it. Let the car run a bit because I just gave it a bit of a belt. Oh, good stuff. Now the thing Liam doesn't know, I'm not very good at like smashing it into second. I don't know if that's me or the second gear synchros, but uh, I guess we're gonna find out. Speed is the key. On the Milmud rock track, we were really starting to feel these bumps. Hours upon hours of whoops and bumps, the track was relentless. What I'm told is the only rock in Big Desert. <laughs> yeah, this is what it's all. This is the main tourist attraction of Big Desert. It's what everyone comes for. <laughs> this is why we came here. Yeah. And what a rock it is. I see. Well, and it doesn't seem like a lot, but I don't. I don't think I could go and pick up a stone anywhere. Nah, so there aren't any really rocks around here at all. No rocks here, so it is sort of. Even though it is small, it is sort of a vantage point. Surprisingly. But I think what everyone else is more excited to see is what's inside the visitor box. It's a rival box. Wow. Lots of stuff. Oh, there's my, that's where my 10 mil spanner, oh, it's a 13, never mind. I think that's a bit stupid, yeah. to be honest. Yeah. Actually, I think there was a full JD in there. Someone's probably drank it. Oh, back. okay. Someone put a Polaroid there, that's pretty cool. Zip tie, that's a good addition. Paracetamol. This box is more exciting than the rock. <laughs> I came here to see. Emus and I only saw a lizard. Alright, uh, there it is. If anyone wants it. Yeah, and, and if and if you did watch this and you do get it, let us know. Like <laughs> send a, I don't know, a photo or something. The only catch is you gotta come up to Milmud Rock to get it, but free sticker in that box. So we had some lunch and then got back out on the track, heading towards our campsite for the night. pretty much the entire day driving, but driving in sand is awesome fun. And eventually, we've reached the main drag. Yeah, for anyone wondering, this is the Murrayville Nile Road, so let you just connect the town north and south of uh, Big Desert, essentially. Just banging on a dirt bike along here. I know, it'd be crazy, eh? All right, so I've just pulled off the main road, uh, and as you can see, there is a big point up here. Um, this doesn't really have a name, it's just a spot you can drive up to, and it's a good look out, get service up here, so yeah, good spot to stop, but we're literally just around the corner from camp, so after we've soaked in the view, I suppose we'll duck on over to camp and then we can set up for the night. So we're just pulling up to a dune here where I think we might be planning on camping tonight, but first we've got to get up it. <laughs>
not too smashed, are they? No, they seem alright. Legend. You know those campsites where you like... I feel like this is every time I go to a campsite that I feel like it's the best campsite I've ever been to. Like when you first set up, you're like, this is like sick. This is awesome. But this spot... No, oh, I've had campsites that have been like, Queen's birthday weekend where everything's busy and you can't find a spot. Definitely been times where like, this is an average site. Yeah, this is a very, this is an above average site. Mm. Like, well above. top 10% sites, I reckon. Yeah. Well, here we are. We've um, made it to our campsite, which is unreal. It's, I, I can't, there's no name for it. It's just on top of an unmarked dune. Yeah, it's not, not named. It's not named, but we're in state, state, uh, state forest. Yep. So it's not national park or anything. Yeah, it was a fun little hill climb up here. And um, now we're surrounded by like literally 360 of Mali. And like, you can see the hills over there near border track. I'm guessing that's where that runs. And, um, Oh, it's insane. It's big dunes just behind us over there. So awesome spot. The wind's not too bad right now, so hopefully it shouldn't be too... We're probably not going to set any awnings up though. Like we know nah. it's not going to rain, so don't really need to. I'll we'll probably mm. just leave it as is really. And then, yeah, we'll hope get a little fire going. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. Watch the sunset and uh, just take it all in. It's just bloody... This place is really good. Yeah, very underrated. 100% underrated. Especially when the weather's mint. Like, like you don't need, no one's swimming in winter anyway. So it's like, you don't, you don't need a water source. So like, unless you like have to be near water so you can fish or something like. If you're just about the camping and the four wheel driving, this is like exactly. a very good destination. And we're here July and, and I'm still wearing a t-shirt. Like it was hot today. Like it was, yeah. it warmed up. So yeah, an awesome place. Highly recommend. Yeah, very good spot. That's camel print. Hey, might even see a camel tonight. <laughs> camel print, jeez, that's unreal. Yeah, they're massive. What wildlife are getting around up here? Oh, I don't know. Well, yeah, camels, emus, um, obviously kangaroos, um, and I don't know, all the reptiles and birds and whatnot, and probably little marsupials and things. And then ferals too, obviously, like cats and foxes and dogs as well. So yeah, a lot, a lot of stuff. So we sat back, watched the sunset at one of the coolest spots we'd ever camped. So we've got a, um, a butterflied lamb leg, which is like uh, pre sort of like marinated slash seasoned with like garlic, herb, things like that. And it's like butterfly, so there's no bone in it. It's spread out, so it means it reduces the cook time dramatically. Um, we're gonna be doing that in the camp oven. And like a lot of people that are new to camping, or maybe if you're young and you don't have much experience cooking, you might think that, oh, all I can cook is burgers or snags. But the reality is, if you've got yourself a camp oven, you can cook a number of things very, very easily, including a roast, which I've had, I've had roast before that I think are better than roasts I've had at home. Sorry, <laughs> mum. But uh, I understand how it is. Or maybe that's just because when you cook it yourself, it tastes better. Maybe. I'll give you a basic rundown. Camp oven, preheating in the fire. Make sure you've got a fire that's got a lot of good coals because you need consistent heat. You don't want to have to be changing over coals all the time or it'll undercook and it's hard to time it. I put a bit of onion in there just for in the flavor in the bottom. Um, you can make like a gravy out of it as well at the end. We're going to be doing roast veggies as well. So I've got some sweet potato and potato there. It's very simple, but the result is like, it's just as easy as cooking snags. Not as quick, I'll give you that, not as quick, but I think the effort is pretty much you know, just as easy sort of thing and the outcome like roast and veg doesn't really get much better than that. Um, now normally, if you were doing a roast, we thought we had a trivet, but we don't. Trivets just like to bring it up off the bottom so the bottom doesn't burn. So instead, Patrick's got this like little steaming thing and we're just gonna use that on the bottom. Upside down like that, that'll keep it off the bottom. Onions, they're gonna go in around the side. And then, it's literally just a matter of, like these are already pre-seasoned, so you don't have to do anything to this. It's literally just pull it out and 
Put it in there. So that's all you do, you just put that in? Yeah. So the veggies come later? Yeah, veggies, yeah, because the roast takes longer than veggies. Yeah. Like, you'll be surprised. Sometimes when you do veggies at home, it seems like they take a while. In a fire like that, good coals, they, they take stuff all. And that's, that's the next key ingredient to a good roast is good coals. So I've created a little pit next to the fire because you sort of want to keep it close so that it's going to, you know, stay warm on the, on the sides as well. Good bed of coals. And obviously, most important part as well is the coals on top. Yeah, well, that's pretty much the gist of it. The most important thing, I think, with uh, a roast is um, timing because you don't want to just wing it and then like keep having to check it and replacing the coals. So fi every 15 minutes rotate regardless. Yeah. yeah. So that way it's getting even back both sides. Yeah. Um, and then every half an hour is top coals. Yep. And then every hour is bottom coals. Because obviously, as you can imagine, being on top, heat rising, the yep. top coals are going to get cooler. And how up. long does a roast like this take to cook? Uh, these thin ones, like you'll probably find you'll open it up at an hour and it'll be looking like, like pretty good. Like it won't need much. All right, so it's been half an hour. So I've already rotated it 15 minutes ago. I'm going to rotate it again now. But I'm also going to uh, just swap over the top coals and maybe see what the bottom coals are like and then obviously while you've got the top stuff off you can have a peek inside and see how it's all going. Oh yeah, coming along. And you can tell the onions are a clear indicator that it's not very far along. Yeah, they're still solid so definitely going to need a, a bit longer. A few more coals on the bottom even though that'll still be hot. Alright, pretty much, you know, it's a potato, it doesn't get much simpler than that. The smaller you slice it, the quicker it'll cook. I'm just going to sort of do them about, I don't know, I'd say it's a, a roughly golf ball sized if you had to average it out. So yeah, we'll just go with that. Alright, so we've done about an hour, so that's uh, four rotations and one coal change, if you want to get technical. Oh yeah, she's looking pretty good. So it's only sort of lukewarm in the middle. But definitely a little bit longer, which is all right, because the spud's obviously going to take time as well. At the next half an hour check, I'd say the roast will probably come out and then the uh, veggies can just cook for a tiny bit longer. <sighs> Let's have a look. It's been an hour and a half. I'm not expecting the veggies to be done, but I reckon the roast should be there. Oh, oh, oh. oh yeah, it's pretty hot on the inside. Yeah, that's mint. Ah, that's good. All right, now obviously these veggies aren't done yet. So we're going to stick them back on. I mean, it should be mint. Yeah. It just works. All right, you don't, have to, you don't have to be, you don't have to be Gordon Ramsay to cook a roast. It cooks itself. There you go. So spuds, good. Meat's good. Patty's got some bread. That's pretty much it. That's pretty sweet. That's a big, that's a big deal. And that's good. I mean, we will actually, Paddy, serve yourself up so we can see if we can make gravy out of what's left in there. As you can see, that at the moment is a little bit runny, so we'll fix that. All right, so flour. I mean, I don't think it matters whereas it's normal self-raising. You don't need much. Don't overdo it either. Yep. That's like gravy. All right, let's go eat it finally. <laughs> looks, the, looks the part. All right, let's just see if it tastes any good. That's the main thing. Yeah, pretty good. All right, so that's basic roast. About as simple as it gets, but, you know, the sometimes all you need is something simple when you're out here. So, yeah, that's about it. Tastes good. Looks the part. So, um, we'll enjoy it now. That's, all it's, uh, that's what it's all about. The next morning was a bloody cold one. You might assume because we're in a desert, it's going to be really hot, but at night time, it chills off and gets freezing. Literally. I bet you why that side's frozen, because that's where the wind is coming in. Yeah. So the wind has like frozen it. All right, so we're all packed up, ready to head over to those dunes over there. So uh, we're heading to Big Dune today, which is meant to be the biggest dune out here. It's the one that's probably the most popular for full drive. Yeah, most people that come in full drive, they all do a Big Dune. It's yeah. like the, 
Yeah, the tester. If, if you're gonna struggle, that's the spot you're gonna struggle. Yeah, sort yeah, of thing. yeah. So yeah, we're gonna head out. It's only like 15 minutes down the road, so we'll head out, do that, and yeah. But what an awesome campsite! Like it was yeah. so real. I, I know. Think. If you can, I mean, it's, it's actually it's quite easy to figure out. Um, there's a few other YouTube videos that show this one yeah. as well. Yeah. But yeah, if you can come here and you have it to yourself, definitely recommend. That morning we hit the tracks early, heading towards the biggest dune in Big Desert. Properly called Big Dune. Alright, so here in front of us is Big Dune. Um, it actually is pretty massive. Yeah, there's like four different lines, they're all varying in difficulty. Um, but yeah, it's pretty steep. So we'll see how we go. That is quite big. Run up point sort of starts here from the like, last way to run up from here. Yeah, this is definitely pretty big. <laughs> Alright, so we're here at Big June. Um, cars are all the way down there. Uh, so there's like four different lines. There's like a really wide left hand line. There's like a real steep one here, straight up the guts. There's another one over there that's like steep but pretty firm. And it also has like a little offshoot where you can go like two different ways. So yeah, I reckon I'm gonna try the firm one first because we should be able to do it, I reckon. And then um, if we do that easy, maybe we'll give another, some of these ones a go as well while we're here. But yeah, up the top, there's a few tracks that branch off as well. So yeah, we'll just see how we go, I suppose. But it's a big run up and um, Yes, we'll see what happens. Oh no, he didn't make it. Well, we were extremely confident that he'd just smash that and uh, well, he didn't. He's going for a big run up this time. <laughs> I had to give it the berries. Yeah. Far out. You, you came with some speed. Yeah, I was first, like third gear flat knacker. <laughs> yeah, far out. That was mint. Well, it looks bloody steep from down here. I will tell you a secret. Uh, Liam's on 16 psi. I'm only on 20, so I might need to drop him down low if I don't make it. But I don't know. Just try it. Low range, third, and just power, and we'll see how we go. As you can see there, there it is. That's just Nissan Superior. My car like makes less power. Um, we weighed them on the trip. Like, take, like five PSI at a time. On the trip, we weighed them. They both pretty much weigh the same, like maybe 30 kilos different. Yeah, I've got leaf hangers to get caught up on. That didn't stop me. So it's just, I don't know. It's all right, you can't win them all. All right, so I've gone from 20 PSI down to 16 PSI on all tires. See if that makes any difference. Hope we can get up. Got close 
Larissa. There's a track that goes up to like an even higher lookout point and we think it's like a loop track. So we're gonna go give that a bell. And then once we've done that, if it does come back where we want it to, we can then come back here and we can have another crack at some of these as well. So let's shoot up there. At just over 100 meters above sea level, Big Dune is one of the highest peaks at Big Desert and offers spectacular 360 views, so it's definitely worth the tough climb to the top. All right, so now we're gonna head back down to the bottom of Big Dune, but we're gonna do this sort of off sprout track, which does look really sick, but it's a very steep drop, this first bit of the track, so we're just gonna take it real nice and easy. <laughs> it looks like it goes straight down, but we'll see how we go. Liam's going first. <laughs> Yeah, I can see why they said this is the steepest descent. First gear, low range. Oh my god. Oh. <laughs> this is very steep. Oh wow. <laughs> One of the steepest angles I've been in on this car. Big Dune is a must do if you're into your four wheel driving. It's usually pretty hard in the summer when the sand's pretty soft, uh, but in the winter time, it's so much more forgiving. Definitely do the loop if you make it to the top because the views are absolutely awesome. It's almost like a blue rag range, but it's in the desert instead. All right, so we just did that little loop and we have to come back past Big Dune anyway, so we'll like stuff it. While we're here, we're gonna give another one of the lines a shot. So this is the next line across to the left. It felt fairly firm, a few wombat holes up at the top, so we'll see how we go when we get up there, but it's pretty much just gonna be the same tactic of third gear uh, and a whole lot of right boot. Yeah, we'll see what happens. Chat as I can go. Yeah. <laughs> it's alright, I'll I'll um I'll have an attempt. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the definition of insanity, but it's something, it's essentially something along the lines of repeating something over and over in the same way and expecting change. 
which uh, is essentially what we have here, but with Patrick and the Land Cruiser. <laughs> Close. I think that's it guys, I've given it the best shot. We can probably put some max tracks down and I reckon I'd make it. But um I don't know, what's the point? We've already been up there, we've already seen what's up there, so um yeah. But anyway, hunt big dude, it's a good challenge. Uh see if you can get your car up here. After Big June, we began to head west to head towards the next big part of our trip, border track. Now, we decided to take the inland tracks to get there, which ended up being a very long, long drive. I have to say, this bloody track's pretty rough on the gear. We've been going for a while now, it's just constant up, down, up, down. We pretty much drove across the entire desert, stopping at some cool sites along the way, but eventually we've reached the border. Next time on Aussie Arvos, we tackle the infamous border track. This track will push your car and yourself to the limits. Oh, I'm over this. That's CV.